Adam and Ro. Hello, Ro. Hello, Adam. What's up? All good at this end, and uh, really looking forward to diving into this week's review, because uh, for me, it was a brilliant show. But before we do that, as always, if this is your first time listening, make sure you hit that subscribe button. If you listen to this on YouTube, if it's on Podbean or any of the other sites that we publish this on, then make sure you either like us, subscribe, or whatever it is that you have to do to get the shows to your uh, phone iPad, whatever it is that you listen to us on. Anyway, um, also, we, we like to give a shout out to some other guys who are doing some good work out there, whether it's Impact or just general wrestling uh, podcast. And, and this week, we want to give uh, some notice to Wrestling Personified. Uh, these guys have been doing this for quite a while. Some, uh, some really good content on there. Check them out on whatever system that you listen to uh, this podcast on because uh, you'll find them on there as well. The other thing, if you're not already doing it, and I can't believe that you're not already doing it because BQ, Row and myself are on there, but check out the Impact Wrestling Fan Zone on Facebook. Give that page a like. Uh, you'll often see us commenting on there and uh, there's always a lot of articles going up, uh, breaking news and those kind of things. So I think that's it for the shout outs, unless you've got any more that you wanted to add, Ro. No, let's carry on. Let's carry on. All right, then. So before we get into the detail of the show, we're going to try and keep it a bit briefer because last week uh, we did run a little long. So apologies for, for anyone who got a bit of earache on the back of that one. Uh, but what did you think of it this week? Yeah, I found it to be excellent, man. I really, at the end of the episode, I was like, oh, wow. You know, it, it seems like they really have, uh, you know, got their stuff together. So it was exciting. Yeah, I always think the good sign of a quality show is when it flies by. And this this episode just started and finished. And, you know, the two hours were done really, really quickly. So uh, for me, excellent show. In fact, it's the show I've most probably enjoyed the most in a long, long time. Certainly going back as far as uh, Eli Drake was, was champion, I think this has been one of my favourite shows. Anyway, let's jump into the detail. Uh, before we start, last week I, I did ask uh, our listeners to drop us comments, those kind of things, and thanks for all those who are doing that. You know, we're quite happy to ask, answer your questions as we go along. Uh, one of the ones I brought up last week was about the commentary team, and I know there were some people who were a little bit unsure about Sanjay and Josh, but what did you make of them this week, Ro? I mean, once again, I mean, it, it seemed a, a little bit better, but, you know, for me, I, you know, as far as, you know, if they're taking anything away, like, to me, the show was so good where, I mean, I couldn't really tell if they were any better or not, but, uh, I mean, they're, they, they've they been okay so far. I, I think they've been excellent, and I think, obviously, we've only got them to compare to Jeremy Borash, who, I like Jeremy Borash, but I didn't think he was a great commentator. Uh, Sanjay's got a bit of a, an odd voice. Uh, it doesn't really lend itself to the table because it doesn't seem to be that much passion in it. But I really like what they've been saying the, the last couple of weeks. I think they've they've actually been really good. And the thing I would like to see a bit more at the moment, which you don't seem to have, is uh, I like it when you have a, a heel and a face um, commentator. And at the moment, they don't really have those roles defined. You know, they're both a bit of colour commentary, not colour commentary, play by play, and a little bit of colour commentary each. And I, and I wish they would kind of define their roles a little bit more. But apart from that, I, I think uh, Sanjay's doing a really good job. All right, so let's get into Sammy Callahan. And before I ask you, Ro, what you thought of this, I, I suppose it would be better if I tell you what I think about Sammy Callahan. He's someone who's come in, and I don't know what it is, but He's got a good look. He's good in the ring, as we saw this week. He's great on the mic. Uh, and he's interesting. But for some reason, I just don't like him. I, I, I don't know what it is. And maybe that's a good heel work. But for, there's something about him that doesn't scream star to me. And I, and I don't get it because he does everything absolutely right. But with regards to this match, I, I thought it was excellent. And I really did think that I was going to be saying this was the match of the night. Because it was a fantastic way to start off. But, but what did you think about it? You know, I, I was just amazed at how much uh, offense uh, Sammy Callahan was allowed to get him in this match against Lashley just because, you know, when it was advertised, I was like, you know, this can go two different ways. And um, it seems like they really see something in Callahan to let him get that much offense on the Lashley. And then, you know, because at, at this point with Lashley, the way that Lashley's been booked, you know, he can afford to eat a couple of losses. 
I like that they went the DQ route just because then you can continue this feud. I will say, man, <laughs> it was pretty disgu- disgusting that um, the part in the match where he did the whole, uh, he hawked the loogie and then I uh, did a chop to lash. I was like, ugh, I kind of cringe. But can I just uh, say, outside, on that, by the way, that uh, it was yeah. a brilliant spot, and, and I tell you what, I, I bet you that takes some skill because if I try to do that, <laughs> get that get that much phlegm up, and actually hit my hand and get it to drip down for the camera, I, I reckon I'd have to take a dozen takes before I got it right. I mean, <laughs> I, I don't know if right. that's something that you. You know, you put on your uh, CV or your uh, resume uh, that I can spit in my hand and make it dribble. But uh, he did he did it brilliantly first time. So uh, you're right, it was disgusting. But at the same time, it made me chuckle because it was something different that I hadn't seen before. Yeah, and um, you know, like I was gonna say, like it was good, and you know, I guess the feud's gonna continue. But like I said, the thing that I'm watching with in all this is what does OVE play in this? Just because even when they uh, uh, when Callahan came out. And they said Callahan along with OVE. And, you know, maybe that was just how they announced it. But, you know, I was always of the mindset he is part of OVE too. And, you know, the thing that you don't want to happen is he becomes bigger than the group. And the group gets lost in the shuffle. But, uh, you know, great match. Um, I was really impressed with Callahan's work. I mean, Lashley's always awesome. So we get to see this continue. Yeah, absolutely. And and as you said, you know, Call- Callahan being part of OVE, he does wear OVE on his uh, vest top thing, uh, his leather, I can't remember what they called it, um, what are they called? Waistcoat kind of thing. I don't know. Uh, so he does have OVE on there, but you're right. It does seem like that he OVE are the, are the two Chris brothers and, and he's just part of, of the group, but not OVE as such. Uh, I was really surprised by the offense as well. And I've got to say, Callahan, I, I thought, did a, a great job in the ring. And these guys, I, I'd be happy to see them wrestle again. They brought something really good to, to this match. What I was really surprised by was actually the fact that there wasn't that much outside interference during the match. It was a pretty even match, as you said, with the offense. You know, you, when you saw this on paper, I, I was absolutely expecting for there to be interference every, you know, 30 seconds, you know, someone putting Lashley's foot. But there really wasn't much of that at all, which was which is good to see. It, it certainly put Calava, uh, Callahan over. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, we get, I think, towards uh, towards the end and that's what follows the DQ. Then, you know, finally you get the interference, which leads uh, Eddie Edwards to come out. And, you know, I guess that sets up or is going to set up Eddie Edwards and Lashley versus OVE, which I find to be an interesting pairing, just given the history that Eddie Edwards and Lashley have. But, you know, it's interesting. Like I said, I I like where this is going. On that note, uh, I believe that Eddie Edwards signed a new contract this week. So he's sticking around Impact for quite some time by the looks of it. So that's good. Uh, I don't know what the, the contract is, you know, how long it is, but it does look like he has re-signed. Uh, it's always, you always worry when you see that, you know, Eddie Edwards re-signs, because you don't know if it's resign or re-signs, but <laughs> in this instance, it was re-sign. Okay, um, so yeah, so Eddie Edwards into, well, not into fear, he came for the save. It looks like that there's going to be some tag team stuff going on and the feud will continue. And obviously this gives... OVE as a group something to do as opposed to just Callahan versus um, uh, Lashley. Okay, so where did we go next? I think it was a, an Eli Drake Chris Adonis interview. Yeah, correct. Um, you know, and what I found interesting in this because with Eli's promos, um, I don't know if you see this, but you see different elements of uh, like I see a little bit of rock, I see a little bit of Ric Flair, and like kind of all combined into one, but uh. He cuts a hell of a promo, man. He does. I, I definitely see the Rock uh, influence in him, absolutely. And there was a bit in the match, which I'm sure we'll come on to uh, later on, but there was a bit where he was standing over um, Austin Aries in the middle of the ring, and I actually thought he was going to do the ele- electronic elbow, or whatever it was the Rock used to call it. You know, <laughs> or he people's puts, elbow. <laughs> the people's elbow, yeah, that's right. Uh, I thought he was going to do that for some reason. But yeah, he does remind me of the Rock, but he is great on the stick and uh, and. When, he gets, when we get to the match, we'll talk about it. But I thought he was, he was the best match he's wrestled in a long time as well. OK, so following off of that, we had uh, some stuff uh, in the L- LAX lair. Uh, I don't know what this segment was all about, really, other than just a bit of we're going to go looking for uh, the Cult of Lee. But it didn't really do much this segment for me. I, I like LAX. I like a bit of humour and things. But it, they always talk about expanding their operation and things like this. And I just want them to define their operation. It just annoys me because I don't know what it is that they're talking about expanding. Um, I'm guessing it's wrestling in other countries or maybe there's some, you know, insinuation it's illegal activity. But to me, I don't know 
but they but they ramble on about this what they're going on about to be honest yeah i you know i took this as maybe you know a way to um, add another member of part of the group I mean, you know, when he kept emphasizing on we need to expand operations, so I thought maybe they're looking to add another member. Um, I mean, that'll be interesting, too. Like I had seen in the comments that, you know, LAX, they kind of need that that heavy muscle because you figure you got the tag team, you know, kind of set up, you know, on Homicide. I don't know if he's a you know a part time guy, but they kind of need that that muscle, that high, like that hired gun, so to speak. So that, that's how what I took away from it. Uh, it seemed like they were sending homicide off, you know, I say just to expand uh, the the operation. But I don't know if that means uh, I took it more as in they're going to be adding a new. Well, they said Mexico. So is that where Crash comes out of? I can't remember. It was that Tijuana um, at the Crash or, or whatever one is or AAA. But but maybe it's about getting on a new partner. Uh, maybe we're going to see homicide wrestle at, at a different venue which is you know which would explain why he's maybe not in the impact zone those kind of things we don't know but it, it, it wasn't a nod promo but it was a bit of a nothing promo to me mm. right you guys over in the states got the gwn flashback of the week do you want to talk us through that because i didn't get to see this in the uk yeah they what they uh revisited was the uh lvn braxton setter wedding you know where he ends up deciding that he's not in love with lvn he's in love with ali um, you know, this was great. I mean, it, you know, they finally seem to show at least some of the people that are still with the company. Um, to be honest, man, I seen this, it made me miss Mike Bennett. I don't know where he's at right now, but, uh, um, but yeah, it, it, it was just cover the wedding and, you know, I'm, I'm, I look, looking back on it, it's crazy how well that went down when it originally aired. Well, Mike Bennett's obviously gone over to WWE with Maria, but I don't think they're up to anything much over there because she's just had a baby, but there you go. Um, yeah, I quite enjoyed the story at the, at the time, but that, that leads us on to, to Ali now. And I'm guessing it's a nice uh, juxtaposition of uh, where she was and where she is now. Uh, and they did this bit well. Although it annoyed me that it looked like she walked into a, a glass wall. <laughs> she just stopped yeah. the, and the music, you know, all dramatic. And then um, yeah, the demon invisible forces, whoever it is who's leaving her these notes or mystical love forces, who knows uh decided to leave a note in the form of a post-it note i mean that's very very mystical and uh enticing isn't it so uh she read it out meet me in tunnel at 22 uh i don't know why she read the word 22 as opposed to saying 10 o'clock but <laughs> there you go that's what she decided to do so we'll catch up with that one in a little minute next up another promo and um it was about Austin Aries uh, talking about his match with Eli Drake. Do you want to take this one? Yeah, my my biggest takeaway take from it was, you know, when he was, ta I guess Austin Aries was talking about, you know, coming back to the company and the way that he can make an impact would be he had to be a top guy and win the the heavy, uh, world title. They've been dubbing it now, not the heavyweight title, but the Impact World Championship. So just a standard promo and, uh, you know, he was giving Eli his credit, just saying, you know, I don't expect this to be a 60, uh, 60 second match, but whether it's 60 seconds or 60 minutes, you know, I'm walking in and walking out world champion. So just your standard promo. Yeah, I thought it was, I thought it was all right. Yeah, and it's, it's good to see that all these guys are uh, getting some talk time as well. I, I think it just reinforced his uh, message about uh, it's he's collecting belts from around the world, which which obviously helped with the, the stuff later on as well. Yeah. So uh, then uh, once again, it's funny. I, I said a few weeks ago, we got like five or six different talk segments in a row and it really took me out of the show. But tonight we didn't. And once again, we got another one here where we had Moose talking about uh, Al Patron. Yeah, this I found this, like I said, I, I, I laugh a little bit because. It, it, you know, it, like I said, at least it gives these guys something to do, because I think. And that's the one thing I've been noticing lately is they're finding ways to keep, you know, the the wrestlers are relevant, the ones that aren't in the title, currently in the title picture. So I just thought it was funny where, you know, I guess this feud is uh, stemming from, you know, El Patron thinking that Moose costed him a number one contendership. It, it's funny when I think about these two, 
and obviously, you know, they're, they're feuding at the moment, which is absolutely fine. Uh, one of them, I'm sure, will go on to, you know, go into the main event at some point, whether that's against Aries or Johnny Impact. But one thing that became apparent is when I was watching the Impact match, uh, which we'll come on to, that Impact to me doesn't seem like a main event star or wrestler. Don't get me wrong, he's very fluid and those kind of things, but he just doesn't seem like someone who you'd want to carry the company. But these two guys, don't care what you say about Alberto, you know, he does seem like a main event guy. And uh, it's good that they're feeding, and as you say, they're doing something. And, and for me, I, do, I don't know what happens at the tapings. Hopefully Johnny Impact is just not fed to Austin Aries or, or uh, Eli. Um, but I, hopefully he doesn't get the title because... I just don't think he's credible enough. He, he, he's just, I don't want to call him a spot monkey, but, you know, a lot of his stuff looks very choreographed. It's very fluid, but it just doesn't look like wrestling. It looks like a choreographed dance. But anyway, uh, we'll come on to that in a minute. OK, we've got Rosemary versus Hanaya, the Huntress. My word, she's uh, a fine looking woman. Uh, so she came down in her wolf mask and uh, yeah. This match, uh, Rosemary came down and, and obviously they started the match up. Um, it wasn't really much of a match because all of the offence that came in seemed to be from the other person missing a move. I, I don't know how many times Rosemary tried to jump into the corner and missed and it hit herself off the turnbuckle. Yeah. But it was becoming quite apparent that this wasn't much of a match during it. And it was the only match, I think, throughout the night that, that I felt let down on. What did, what did you think of it? You know, what, what I thought, and I don't know if you saw this too, I just kind of thought, you know, it seemed, you know, to go by relatively quick, but it looked like it was designed where maybe they're going to just be done with this angle altogether, given that Hanaya is no longer with the company. I mean, I don't know, like after the match finished, I didn't feel like, oh, this feud must continue. Like I, I wouldn't be surprised if they, you know, next week, Rosemary's, you know, starting a new program. So, yeah, um, it, 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 I mean, I don't know. I guess that's all I have to say about it. <laughs> yeah, it, it just flew by. And as I said, it, 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 you know, even the finish, I, I don't like it when faces, unless they're complete underdogs, get a roll up pin. You know, I, I know it was she rolled through on, on the splash and won the match that way, but it just seemed like a cheap finish for a face, you know, that she didn't get her revenge on Hanaya. If anything, she just got a lucky win. So, anyway, it was what it was. Let's not dwell on it, uh, just like Hanaya didn't dwell in Impact. Right, on to the okay. next one. Uh, we went to Matt Sedell and Johnny Impact talking about some spiritual stuff. Um, and Johnny Impact just looking stoned, to be honest, and going, yeah, whatever, man, kind of thing. Um, this really didn't do anything for me at all. And it just reinforces the fact that you know, even when you got these two there talking, Matt Sedal is the one that seems like the star, not Johnny, uh, not Johnny Impact at this point. Yeah, I, you know what? I think just because we're seeing like the slow, and it, it doesn't come across as it right now, but we're seeing kind of like the slow uh, heel turn with Saito. Yeah, absolutely. So um, uh, we'll come on to that in the match in a second where that goes. But then we had Tyrus back. OK, question for you and question for our listeners. Uh, Tyrus, are you glad to see him back? I suppose that's the easiest way of putting this. Do you think he adds anything to the Impact roster? Um, not really, man. And and I found myself just thinking, like, if... And I know we're going to get into the match later. I felt like that was kind of the one match where I was just kind of like... It just seemed it didn't click. It seems like Tyrus's role is best served when he's um, kind of the muscle for a group. You know, we've seen this, you know, when he used to be with... Um, EC3, Eli Drake, he seems better served in that role. I mean, if they wanted to, and this is something I came up with, you know, maybe you pair him with Congo Kong, and I mean, I guess if you were going to turn Fala Ba, and you could kind of have kind of like that Dungeons of Doom type of stable, and, and have uh, Jimmy Jacobs run it, I mean, that gives the guy something to do, but outside of that, I just don't see the spot for him on the roster as far as you know, I, I can't really see him being in the main event or even in the tag team scene at this point. I just see him being kind of like, you know, that hired hired muscle, like a bodyguard type. Well, the interesting thing about it is you said about Congo Kong there. I'm sure just before he left, didn't he stand up to Congo Kong? Um, I can't remember who Kong was attacking, but I'm sure uh, Tyrus 
was mooted to, to be going into a programme and then obviously he left, so it never happened. Uh, and I think that's when uh, Grado kind of stood in for the squash or something along those lines. I can't remember exactly what happened, but it wasn't that long ago, just before he left. So maybe they'll revisit that. But as you quite rightly said, they've got some big guys on, on the roster now. You throw in Abyss as well, which is obviously part of the, the Congo Kong storyline. It'll be interesting to see if they do anything with this. But uh, I, I actually like him. I think he moves quite well for a big guy. He's got he's, he's really good on the mic. And uh, he's got a bags of personality, something that you can't say about Kong. So, you know, I, I, I didn't, I, I don't mind seeing him, but I actually quite, I, I think he does add something. I think we can differ on that one, but it'll be great to hear you guys in the comments section below. Let us know what you think about Tyrus and whether you're happy to have him back. OK, um, for me, the stupidest section of the night was up next, which was Ali backstage uh, at in Tunnel 20, in, ten, in the Tunnel or 22, uh, look, picking up her love-shaped chocolate box, reading the card, and then, for some reason, Laurel Van Ness is now hiding out in crates. And uh, this surprise attack is up there with, uh, I suppose, Dick Dastardly in Wacky Races in that it was ill-conceived and went completely wrong. Um, I just don't get this segment at all. It was awful. See, I found it to be funny, but I think where I was just confused was... Are, were they revealing that she was a secret admirer or, you know, was that just kind of just like a throw off? Well, that, for me, that's the only way that they could save this if it wasn't Laurel Van Ness. And, you know, she just basically saw the note as well and tried to jump on it. And it continues in another fashion that there is a secret admirer. But I, I'm guessing we'll see. But to me, uh, I don't like it when heels, especially this is the champion. I know Creative knew that she's leaving at this point. <clears throat> Excuse me. But it just seems crazy to have the champion doing sneaky tactics and actually getting no offence in when you're doing the sneaky tactics. I know it's building the Ali character, who, by the way, looked once again stunning. Uh, but but it was just a stupid segment, um, which didn't advance anything. And I don't even know why Laura Van Ness is, is that upset. She's the champ. It's not like she's cheated Ali. Out, she's been cheated out of the title by Ali. It should be the other way around, this, this kind of thing, if anything. But anyway, it is what it is. Uh, OK, so back to EC3, Tyrus, Johnny Impact and Mike, Matt Sidal. Um, Sidal. I can't say his name. I have a mental block over that one. Right. OK, so uh, once again, this match I quite enjoyed. And the one thing that this told me about Johnny Impact, as I said earlier, is that he's not a main event player. To me, he seems absolutely suited to being a tag team with someone like Matt Seidel. Um, they reminded me of the Rockers a little bit or the Rock and Roll Express or those kind of high flying teams. Uh, the Killer Bees or whatever you want to call them. And, and to me, they work really well together. But it's because they're so fast and they pull off these snazzy moves. It, but it doesn't seem single star to me. It doesn't seem like a singles main eventer. What, what did you make of this? Um, I don't know. This match, this was a match for me where it, I don't know, it seemed like it didn't mesh. It just in my eyes, not that it was necessarily bad, but I, I don't know if it was just the inclusion of Tyrus or whatever. But, um, and I guess, you know, this is going to set up uh, with, you know, EC3 and Tyrus getting the win. This is going to set up EC3 versus uh, Johnny Impact for the number one contendership. I guess uh, Johnny Impact's putting his number one contendership on the line. But as far as what you're saying with Impact being main event talent, I, I wonder if maybe it just has to do with him being face. You know, we've seen sometimes with guys where their role, they're probably better served as playing heel or vice versa. Um, I could totally see him being world champion. I mean, I don't think I can't see a long reign, but I could see something where he has it for like a month or so and, you know, gets screwed out of it. But I think, you know, bringing him over, I mean, the goal was to eventually down the road, I'm sure, put the title on him because, you know, he's, you know, seen as a, a big name. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I think you're most probably right. Uh, I don't agree with it, as in that they should put the title on him just because he is a name. I mean, he's good in the ring and, and I'm sure the kids will like him and the casual viewers will look at it and go, wow. But to me, I mean, you, you look at guys like 
Ishimori and even Phantasma, you know, those guys put on a, a, rest, a wrestling clinic with slick moves, but it actually looked like they were fighting. Whereas when you see Johnny Impact, it looks like he's just dancing around you. And, you know, there's some things he does, like he, he did a flip from the ropes over the, you know, uh, into the middle of the ring, uh, you know, over, I can't remember, it was over Tyrus or something like that. And the commentators, fair play to him, they sold it well. But as I said, I, I just have a problem with him. I don't know what it is. It just, he doesn't. For me, he just doesn't do it. And it might just be that he needs a heel turn. I can see him as like a, well, I know that originally he was John Johnny Morrison or John Morrison because he looks like Jim Morrison. And I can see him with that kind of rock star gimmick, you know, that swagger with an entourage or someone like Tyrus, ironically, um, as his muscle. So let's see where it goes down the line. OK, so we went to the offices of Park, Park and Park. Uh, not park, park, park and park, just park, park and park. And Jimmy Jacobs and, a, and uh, Congo Kong went in there to one of the worst looking sets. You can see it was just a room that they set up for the for the purposes of this. But uh, once again, for me, this was a pretty much nothing segment. But at least it did continue the storyline. They didn't just forget about it. So you can't really argue with it as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I agree. Just uh, progressing the, the storyline. So, you know, nothing to argue there. Yeah. So then we got the debut of Brian Cage. So this this was pretty awesome. Um, it's funny they keep calling it the, the debut because obviously he did wrestle in, in TNA years ago and um, the gut check. And I think at the time people were amazed that they didn't take him when he was in the gut check because he looked really good. Uh, but this was impressive. And I know he was facing enhancement talent against John Cruz. But it was it was pretty good, wasn't he? Yes, man. I mean, this was just pure brutality. I mean, I already kind of looked when I seen, you know, the enhancement talent and, you know, the guys, you know, look like a small, smaller guy. And I was like, this guy has no shot. And you know what? When you want to debut a guy, especially someone of Brian Cage's caliber and really get them over as kind of like a powerhouse, this is the way you do it. I mean, just even how he was able to go from the power bomb and launch him into the turnbuckle for the buckle bomb. And then uh, he pulled out the Steiner screwdriver. That's one of these moves. I mean, um, even when Steiner was active, he would rarely do it just because it's one of these uh, dangerous moves. But wow, I was very impressed with the, the debut. Now, I haven't seen him in Lucha Underground, but I, I do remember when he was in Gut Check years ago. And the one thing that I do seem to remember, and maybe this is why they didn't sign him at the time, I don't think he's that tall. Um, and I don't know if that's maybe part of the reason why, you know, he hasn't been on Vince's radar uh, over at WWE or something like that. But he, for memory, he's quite small. Although he's obviously massive, you know, muscle wise, uh, I don't think he's that tall. So it will be interesting when they put him in against someone, I don't know, like what, Tyrus or Congo Kong or even he doesn't have to be that tall. I think he's, uh, you know, like 5'10 or something like that. So we'll, we'll see. We'll see. But very, very impressive. One comment I do want to make about him, though, and it was really pretty off putting to me, was his outfit. Um, and I don't know if you noticed the same thing that I did. And uh, I already made comments about the ladies attire for Hanaya earlier on, uh, but it did seem to kind of show off everything for Brian Cage. <laughs> uh, I think you know where I'm going with that. And uh, I really hope that he does something different. I don't know how he, how he hides himself, but uh, yeah, it was quite off-putting for me um, at times seeing this, especially when in his finishing movie, he's got the guy and he's putting his face in his crotch as he brings him down. So uh, <laughs> a bit of a random observation. Uh, sorry to our listeners for having to endure that there. And I, I've washed my eyes out with soap and water since. Right. OK, so next, uh, my favourite thing about Impact, we're up. The Cult of Lee doing their backstage segment. I, these guys could, they could, honestly, they could read the phone book and I'd enjoy it. They're, they're really, really good. So th this was, this was good. What did you make of it? You know, just once again, a uh, storyline progression. You know, it looks like they're really, you know, taking Cult of Lee serious as a tag team because, you know, they could have easily just been just a team for LAX to run through, but they're really taking their time to kind of build this feud between them and LAX. So I liked it. Good. I really hope these guys get a, a decent push because I've just got a feeling that when they do face LAX, they'll, I, I really hope they're not treated as jobbers. I really hope they're not like an enhancement tag team. And I know 
you don't really get that when you've got guys who are established. But I, I hope they give LAX a good feud because they, they, they're killing it at the moment of the backstage stuff. And they have been for months, even when they're in the X Division. I just hope that they just don't turn it, as you say, you know, have LAX just run through them easily. I hope it is competitive to some, to some extent. Um, go back to the commentary here. I, I did like uh, Sanjay's input into the fact that when they attacked the Mumbai Cats, that, that it wasn't uh, the Mumbai Cats. Uh, you know, these, these were the guys who, that they were just different people. So I, I'm glad he brought that because obviously uh, I think the cult of Lee dressed up with them when, when Sanjay was feuding with Trevor Lee from memory. Anyway, moving on. Uh, there was a bit of fellow bars. Well, once again, they kept him on screen. I, I, I've got to say, he, the crowd seemed to love him. And, uh, it's, you know, I know he's turning into a bit of a comedy character, but I hope they do use him properly. Actually, that reminds me of something else. They mentioned Richard Justice. When were they mention? Oh, they talked about Richard Justice when uh, they were saying about Andy's admirer, secret admirer. Uh, I love the fact that they brought him up. Richard Justice is a guy they should have around more. Anyway. Okay. Ishimori, El Hijo del Fantasma. What a match this was, eh? Yeah, this was um, pay-per-view quality in my eyes, man. I mean, I mean, in I, the thing that I like too and I always kind of just you know I felt like maybe beating a dead horse about it was you know when they were having all these partnerships the key thing was how they were going to utilize some of these guys because previous history they've uh underutilized some talent where it prevented a lot of partnerships but I mean out of the partnerships these are the two guys man that I, I really can see you know both these guys being you know long term in impact just the way that they use them and this match right here they let them put out you know laid out a match this was some excellent pay-per-view quality type stuff i mean ishimori is well both of them are, are some fantastic wrestlers uh, but i mean the the jump over the top rope the suicide dive over the top rope and uh, and also i think they called it a golden moonsault where he, he did the moonsault to the outside both of them just just put on an absolute wrestling clinic in this. And bearing in mind, you don't ever hear these guys talk uh, for obvious reasons. You know, you still buy into them. You buy into them as athletes. You buy into wrestlers as interesting characters. And and they've really served these guys really really well, as far as I'm concerned. And I think this was most probably match of the night for me um, from a wrestling standpoint, it's certainly. And I, I, what I'd like to see now is Phantasma to get some kind of push because I can't remember him winning too much so far and he deserves to win because the crowd love him the crowd really like him uh obviously not from his Phantasma run most probably from is it King Cuerno is that who he is or uh, whoever he is in Lucha so uh, the, the fans seem to like him though so I really think that they sh he deserves maybe a couple of wins against you know your, your Braxton Sutters some of your X-Division guys that are around but the one thing that was there was obvious and, and missing from this we haven't seen desmond xavier for a couple of weeks now so he seemed to got off the radar which is a bit of a shame yeah i was thinking about that uh because i think that's that's a feud you know ishimori and desmond xavier if you want to do uh you know a best of seven series or something of that magnitude you could because those guys they got great chemistry in the ring but uh yeah uh, my favorite spot in this match was when they were outside of the ring and uh Ishimori did that step up her Karana like he ran down the ramp and then kind of just jumped up and did a Rana. I thought that was incredible. It was really good. And one thing I noticed about this match as well, they had quite a lot of slow mo action that they they went yeah. and replayed, which was good, which is nice to see as well. I like it when they do that. Uh, it's something that they do very very well. Okay, uh, although they didn't do a slow-mo action replay of Sammy Callahan spitting in his hand. That would have been good yeah, to see how he did it. All right. Uh, I talked about there was quite a lot of um, talky segments earlier on, back-to-back, -back, you know, uh, promos and things. Uh, this time, we've had two matches back-to-back -back because it kind of went from that straight into the Austin Aries-Eli Drake match. And uh, this, they gave it a lot of time. I, I, I think it must have been a, at least 20, 25 minutes uh, they gave this match, maybe not actually on airtime, but, you know, with the ad breaks, there was certainly 20 minutes left on the taping that I watched. Um, but it was good. It was a really good match. Um, and it was the best that I've seen Eli Drake wrestle, as far as I'm concerned, in his whole run as champion. This was the best match that he's been involved in. And that, uh, what was it, a springboard moonsault where he jumped up the, to the top rope and flipped over. I've never seen him pull that one out before, but yeah, kudos to the guy. Yeah, this this was another one, like you say, you know, back to back. We got two back to back uh, pay per view quality type of matches, and you know, watching this match, where it assured me that Eli's gonna be okay. 
like because you know once again i was wondering i'm like the way this is laid out or however they do this match will determine you know what how, how they perceive eli and they really made eli look like a main, main event player i mean kudos to austin aries too because you know you know for some of us we were kind of you know there was mixed feelings about as far as well why they take the belt off of Eli and just put it on Austin Aries and I kind of can understand a little bit because you know you figure with Austin Aries doing the whole belt collector gimmick to have him come in and uh, win the Impact World Championship you know that that uh, elevates him a little bit but yeah I really thought this match made Eli and um, like I said I, I think he's going to get the belt back sometime this year. I think when you look at champions and how good they've been over their runs um, what is not only as important as the matches you have as champion, it's about how you lose the title. And I think although Eli's title reign wasn't great when he had the belt, I think the way that he's lost the title, he's gone out looking like, well, he looked like a chump two weeks ago. But this match, as you say, he's going to be all right. He looked really good in this. And uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I would, I would happily see this for a third time, although I'm guessing that could very well be it now. I don't, I don't know where we go with this, but... Uh, hopefully we'll see these guys further on down the line and, and Eli will win it back at some point. But as you say, fair play to Aries. He, you know, for a, for a smaller guy in the ring, he he puts on and he, he's a strong guy and he puts in some, some, some great wrestling moves. So that was pretty much it. Um, I'm trying to think there was one thing. Oh, yeah, there was one thing I, I mentioned about Brian Cage's outfit earlier on. I, I figured out what it is that annoys me about Eli Drake. Uh, the one thing I don't like about him is his boots. And I don't know why I've gone all fashionata on us this week and started talking about outfits and costumes and those kind of things. But I always find his shoes really off-putting. I don't know if it's something you've noticed or not. You know, I had for the longest time, uh, you know, I thought he was wrestling in uh, Jordans, you know, like uh, sneakers and whatnot. But um, I think that's just the way his boots are designed. It, it doesn't bother me. It's something different and unique. It gives him that, you know, type of look to distinguish himself from others. Yeah, I mean, certainly, you know, it's him, but I don't know. It, it makes his feet look massive. <laughs> his feet look bigger than other wrestlers' feet, you know, and it's just a strange look. But as you say, if it's something that's going to define him and, and differentiate him, that's fine. But I'm guessing what, where I was coming from, he probably doesn't need that because uh, he's so good on the mic anyway. Uh, people are always going to know who uh, Mr. Drake is. All right, so... That's it for the Impact Review this week. We're, we're quicker than last week, not as quick as we have been. Uh, but yeah, we've got through it. Um, so I suppose that gives us a couple of minutes to talk about any news stories that you want to bring up this week. Uh, nothing at the top of my head. The only thing I just wanted to mention is for next week on Impact, we're going to get Lashley and Eddie Edwards versus OVE. EC3 versus Johnny Impact with the number one contendership for the Impact World Championship on the line. Moose versus uh, Alberto El Patron. We get Matt Seidel defending the the. I, I I think this is a title defense, but um defending the Grand Championship against a returning Petey Williams, which that should be awesome. And then we're gonna get LAX versus the Cold of Lee. So you know, pretty stacked stacked card. I mean, two back to back weeks. Um, so yeah. Yeah, I, if they can. Pull off a show like they have this week, great. Uh, the only thing that worries me sometimes when they have these stacked shows is that they don't have time for, for storyline progression. But hopefully we'll see some of that. And, uh, yeah, it, if, if they can continue this run. I know last week we were a little bit down on it. But, you know, looking at some of the comments online, it went down really well with, with the viewers at home. And uh, there was a bump in ratings this week up to the 300,000 mark. You know, I think that's where they're going to stay pretty much now whilst they're on pop. I think it's going to be very hard to get them up any higher. But, uh, yeah, good stuff, good times for impact. And I think he said to me, I don't think it was at the beginning of the show, I think it was maybe before we start recording, that you're hopeful of this uh, this, this Callis and Scott DeMoor partnership uh, are doing good things and you're optimistic for the future. Yeah, no, most definitely, man. I, you know, my takeaway was, and I think the... Uh, I don't know if it was the viewership was up, but the ratings were done. One of them. And, you know, that stuff, I find that stuff confusing. But I think, too, everyone kind of watches Impact on different platforms. 
But uh, I really feel, and I hope this doesn't, you know, come back to bite me or bite any of us Impact fans, but this regime, they kind of got it going. Like, we knew the changes weren't going to just happen overnight. It was going to take time, but you can really see, like, the groundwork and just different things. And, you know, you're seeing some of the storyline progression with characters. You know, we're not seeing kind of like these one-off matches and then, you know, it's totally scrapped. Like, they're doing a lot of... um like I'll take a page out of BQ's book. He always talks about long-term booking and I see some elements with this regime thus far that indicates that that's the mindset. So that's, that's enjoyable. Final thing that uh, I just want to comment on is that they've obviously now announced that the, the next pay-per-view is coming up uh, off the top of my head. I've completely forgotten what it's called, uh, but it is happening at the impact zone. Uh, is it absolution or redemption? Redemption. Yeah. Is it? Redemption. 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 Yeah. So uh, it looks like they're not going to be going ahead with lockdown, which for me personally, I'm really pleased with because, you know, cage match after cage match for me, it, I never liked that pay-per-view anyway, particularly. So I'm glad that uh, they're coming up with something new and, and let's hope it's, uh, you know, going to be a, another tentpole one, the same way that Bound for Glory and Slammiversary are. But that's happening. Is it April time? I think April. Yes. Uh, yes. April. So uh, that means we're going to get through these shows and then that leads us to the pay-per-view so yeah that's it for us make sure to hit subscribe thanks for listening and as i said leave us any comments that you want in the, the section below and we'll be happy to uh answer them next week on the show but for the time being it's uh goodbye for me and good night bro yeah take care everybody